Hello, everybody. So welcome. I am Christy Craig. I'm the publisher here at Hidden Timber Books. And um, thank you for joining us today on this Saturday afternoon for another of our small press author reading events. And just to give you a little bit about this series, Hidden Timber Books began this um, small press author reading series about a year ago. And um, I started it because I you know, wanted to help out during COVID times, but it's really grown into its own special series of a, you know, a way to build literary community and to bring readers and authors together from near and far and to highlight some of the other small presses around the country because you know we're all in this together. So it's been a really fun event. I'm glad that you're here. As I said, this is recorded so you can watch it again. You can go back through our YouTube channel and see some of the other reading events that we've had as well. Mm -hmm. We have a great event planned for you today. I spoke with Leslie a couple of days ago. I'm really excited to have her, Leslie, yeah, I'm really excited to have her here. And um, she's got some fun things planned to share with you about her work and some discussions on it. So a little bit about Leslie Newman. She has created 75 books for readers of all ages, which includes poetry collections, a novel in verse entitled October Morning, A Song for Matthew Shepard, and children's books. She has received awards for her work, including a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. And she was the Poet Laureate of Northampton, Massachusetts from 2008 to 2010. She teaches at Spalding University School of Creative and Professional Writing. And uh, she's just a prolific author. So. Leslie, welcome. I'm so excited to hear you read from your book today and to talk with you about your work. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Christy, for creating this series and having me be a part of it. I am just such a firm believer in small press poets and poets in general supporting each other and, and supporting each other's work. So it's just really, really nice to be here. Um, so I, I'm, my latest project was a pair of memoirs in verse. I carry my mother and I wish my father. So that's what I'll be reading from. Um, so before I do that, what I like to do is just show um, a few images of my parents so that you can get a feeling for who they were and who they are to me. So if all goes well, I'm going to share my screen. So this, it, this won't be through the whole reading. It will just be um, right at the, at the beginning. So um, this is my mom. Um, and I'm always amused at that doll, which is pretty much the same size as she was. She was born in 1928 in Brooklyn, New York. And she took dance lessons, as you can see. And this is the first picture of my dad. There are no pictures of him as a baby. Um, you know, picture, photos were expensive in those days. He was born in 1927. So he was definitely going through his awkward stage at this point. This is my mom. I always ask people to guess how old she was. And most people say 23, 25. This is my mom at 15. Um, this is when she and my dad first met. Uh, and this is my dad in high school. So he grew out of his awkward stage. And so this is when they were dating. And this is their wedding photo, which they got married on October 1st, 1949. So um, my mom was 21, my dad was 22. Uh, this is my dad uh, graduating from law school. My mother sold shoes in Orbax to put him through law school and you see their shoes on the cover of the book I carry my mother and my mother loved shoes, as do I. And here is a picture of me and my mom. I was a kind of chubby little baby with a lot of hair. This is, I love this picture. I, don't know, I, just, I just love this picture of my mom and I. And, um, oh, I didn't grab it from the closet, but I actually still have that sweater, though, of course, it no longer fits me. And here we are in a park in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn. This is the park near our apartment building. And here I am with my dad on the same day. Someone must have had a camera. 
Uh, and these are my parents. Um, this is kind of how I think of them uh, from my childhood. This was at my brother's bar mitzvah. So that was in the 60s, which I think you can tell from my, my mom's hairstyle. This was the 60s. And then this is how I think of them when, as from when I'm an adult, uh, that we moved to Long Island and my mom is doing the New York Times crossword puzzle as she did every Sunday, every day actually. And um, my mother loved this dress that she's wearing. It's called a coat dress because you can, it's, you put it on like a coat and my mother would gain and lose weight periodically throughout her life, but this, this uh, coat dress always fit her. And uh, this was taken at my bat mitzvah. I had an adult bat mitzvah when I was 48 years old. I think 48, yeah. And this is my spouse with my mom. Uh, this was taken three weeks before my mom died. And we were in New York to see an uh, uh, off-Broadway musical, A Letter to Harvey Milk, based on my short story. And this is the last picture of me and my mom. She died in 2012, in August of 2012. And uh, this is my dad, the bachelor now, or the widower, I should say, uh, cooking himself a matzo fry. Uh, he was a tennis player. As you can see, here he is in action. And then he took lessons with uh, Rod Laver, who I guess is a very famous tennis player. People who know tennis are always very impressed with this. I, I had no idea who he was. And this was at my nephew's bar mitzvah, which my mother really had hoped to live to attend, but she did not. And I think that's one of the last pictures uh, taken of me and my dad. Uh, my dad was 89 and it was right before he had to move from his home into independent living. And uh, this is a visit he took. Uh, my dad got into selfies. So here is me and my spouse and my dad. I kind of love that picture. Um, this, I love this picture too, my spouse and my dad. And that's my mom saying l'chaim and my dad kind of waving goodbye. And that's uh, my parents may their memories be for a blessing. So I thought I would just present some images so you would have those in your head as I read to you. So now I will read to you. And what Christy suggested, I've never done this before, but we can try it, is for me to read a little and then um, take some questions and then read a little more and then take some questions. So, um, you know, because we're such a nice, small, intimate group, we can have um, a conversation. So we'll try that. And if nobody has any more questions, then I'll just continue to read. So the first part will be um, from my book, I Carry My Mother. The second part will be poems from I Wish My Father. And then I thought I would also read you a children's book and talk a little bit about uh, poetry and children's books and the um, the relationship between the two, because I, I'm on this kind of one woman mission to get more poets to write children's books. Okay, so now I will begin by reading from I Carry My Mother. The deal. My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. She's got six months to live a year at most. His words lodge in my gut a heavy meal. My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. I'm very sorry, I know how you feel. But keep your chin up, don't give up the ghost. My mother's doctor tells me here's the deal. She's got six months to live a year at most. So this is a series of 16 or so triolets and you can hear the form, there's rhyme, there's repetition, etc. My father strokes my mother's swollen hand, his broken body bent in half with grief. He stares down at his ancient wedding band. My father strokes my mother's swollen hand. This ending is so far from what they'd planned. His face a wrinkled mask of disbelief. My father strokes my mother's swollen hand, his broken hot body bent in half with grief. My mother points a finger, don't you cry. My life has been terrific until now. She stares at me till we see eye to eye. My mother points a finger, don't you cry. You're making it too hard for me to die and that I absolutely won't allow. My mother points a finger, don't you cry. My life has been terrific until now. And now my mother lets her hair go gray. For 40 years, she's kept it curled and dyed. I never thought I'd live to see the day. And now my mother lets her hair go gray. She asked my father what he has to say. Now you're sexy and you're dignified. And now my mother lets her hair go gray. 
For 40 years, she's kept it curled and dyed. My mother tells me where she hides her jewels, the diamonds that she wore when just a bride. I'm damned if I will cry, I know the rules. My mother tells me where she hides her jewels. A nurse comes by to ask about her stools. I couldn't make this stuff up if I tried. My mother tells me where she hides her jewels, the diamonds that she wore when just a bride. And now my father's heart is full of hope. My mother's had two good days in a row. He clings to her, their hands a twisted rope. And now my father's heart is full of hope. And I, the daughter, clueless how to cope while deep inside my mother's tumors grow. And now my father's heart is full of hope. My mother's had two good days in a row. At last it is my mother's final hour. No more second chances, no reprieve. The stench of death is bitter, sharp, and sour. At last it is my mother's final hour. My father has lost every ounce of power. He wipes his runny nose upon his sleeve. And at last it is my mother's final hour. No more second chances, no reprieve. Uh, so this poem is um, gives directions. This is a form of poem a lot of poets use. Um, and this is step-by-step -step directions. Sometimes you can write a poem like this about an actual practical task, or this is more of an emotional task. And um, this kind of shows how my father and I really had to take the last couple of days of my life, of my mother's life, one minute, one second, one instant at a time. It's called How to Watch Your Father Watch Your Mother Die. Sit beside him on a folding chair beside your mother's bed. Place a box of tissues between you. See how he takes your mother's hand in both his own and strokes it like a small, wounded animal. Do not speak. Do not turn on the TV. Do not shatter the silence around you. Let time pass. Listen to your father sigh. Listen to your father sob. Hand your father a tissue whenever necessary. Ask your father if he wants something to eat. Ask your father if he wants something to drink. Ask your father if he wants to go for a walk. Do not press him when he says no to everything. Remember the one thing he wants is impossible to give him. Let more time pass. When your father gets up to go to the bathroom and says, hold mom's hand, hold your mother's hand. When he returns, give your mother's hand back to your father. It belongs to him. Do not tell your father what the hospice nurse told you. You need to let go so she can let go. When the sun sets, gather the darkened room around your shoulders like a cloak. Watch your father's undying love. Take your mother's breath away. And I will uh, end this part of the reading by reading the title poem. Uh, this is a rhyming pantoum. So you'll again hear a rhyme scheme and repetition. I carry my mother. I carry my mother wherever I go, her belly, her thighs, her plentiful hips, her milky white skin she called this side of snow, the crease of her brow and the plump of her lips. Her belly, her thighs, her plentiful hips, the curl of her hair and her sharp widow's peak, the crease of her brow and the plump of her lips, the hook of her nose and the curve of her cheek. The curl of her hair and her sharp widow's peak, the dark beauty mark to the left of her chin, the hook of her nose and the curve of her cheek, her delicate wrist so impossibly thin, the dark beauty mark to the left of her chin, her deep set brown eyes that at times appeared black, her delicate wrist so impossibly thin, I stare at the mirror, my mother stares back. Her deep set brown eyes that at times appeared black, her milky white skin she called this side of snow. I stare at the mirror, my mother stares back. I carry my mother wherever I go. So I'm gonna pause, see if anyone has any questions. Christy, maybe you can uh, monitor that from the chat. 
I definitely will. If anyone has a question, just um, drop your name in the chat and we'll go along the line that way. Um, and while we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, I'll just kind of get the conversation started. Um, I love the triolets and the rhyming pantoum. You know, I don't often know what the te technical names of certain kinds of poems are, but the rhyming and the repetition is, um, I think, especially effective when you're writing about a topic like this. Um, so those were beautiful, beautiful, thank you. And I just wanted to ask about, you know, you've written this companion of books, this, these two companion books of poetry, and you've written across several different genres. And I encourage everyone to go and see Leslie and Newman's website. There's just a plethora of different kinds of books to look through from nonfiction to poetry to short stories, everything. And I'm just curious why you chose poetry to write about your mother and your father, if there was a certain reason for that, or um, you know, were you just drawn to that particular um, genre for this particular topic of mothers and daughters and fathers and daughters and grief? Or um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious why you chose poetry. So poetry is my first love. I've been writing poems since I was eight years old. And I started writing poetry actually out of loneliness. Um, and as you know, I don't know why nobody said to me, you know, why don't you write some poetry? It was just innate. It just came out of me. And especially writing about um, deep feelings and grief, I find poetry incredibly useful, especially formal poetry, because, um, you know, losing a parent, for those of you here who have, you know what it's just, it's just this bottomless howl of grief. That's how I describe it. And I needed a container to pour all that emotion into, something that would hold all that emotion. So the forms really do two things at once for me. Um, they distanced me from my feelings in a way because I had to focus on the, the pattern, the rhyme breaks, line breaks, the rhyme, the rhythm. But they also brought me closer to my feelings because I had to draft these poems over and over and over again. And every time I wrote and revised, I was back in it. So I, I found that tension of distance and nearness a very, very useful. But also, and this very much surprised me when my mom died, this didn't happen when my dad died. I wrote um, about a half a dozen personal essays, and I don't usually write in that form, and they were very um, well received. So I thought that was that was kind of interesting. Just, um, you know, and I didn't plan it, they just started coming out. Well, I think that's what makes a great writer, just that willingness to just put pen to paper and see what comes out, whether it's poetry or essays, and, and to go with it. That's great. Um, one more question uh, before we move on to any more reading or um, if anyone else has any questions. So I've listened to and um, read some work from a couple of different authors who discussed memoir. And, you know, there's always that question about the healing that comes in writing memoir or memoir like pieces like poetry. And, um, you know, what I've, what I heard recently was that the healing doesn't necessarily happen just in the writing of it, but it happens in the revising of it and the shaping of it, which is kind of what you just talked about, that tension between distance and nearness. So I wondered about, you know, as far as when looking back on your relationship with your parents, whether it was when you were writing the book about your mother or the one about your father, how did that change your perspective on your relationship with them or did it change any part of you like you know in, in, in exploring the past in that way through through poetry well you know my mom and i did not always get along um and i feel like i found an, a newfound tenderness in writing about her and, and a new appreciation for her and her her beauty her love her intelligence and her, all the sacrifices that she made um, for me and for my dad actually, um, so that we could live the lives that she couldn't live. She wanted to be a writer and she never fulfilled that dream for various reasons. And she really got a lot of pleasure of seeing my success as a writer. Um, and my dad, kind of interesting, you know, they say, let me see if I can get this right. 
comedy equals tragedy plus time, right? So a lot of the things that were very tragic at the end of his life now are kind of amusing. And as I've read these poems, I, was, I actually was very surprised that some people have found them very funny. I'm surprised, not offended at all, but just kind of interested to see that he was a very big personality, which I hope I captured in these poems. And um, you know, some of the things you know, are actually kind of amusing. And I kind of wish he was here, here so we could laugh about them together. Yeah. Well, let's hear you read from his, from the book, I Wish My Father. All right, so um, so my parents died five years apart and um, they had a plan. I, I don't think I mentioned this in the poems that, that I'm reading, but it is in here that he would die first and that's not how it worked out. And he, you know, I think my mother would have done a lot better without him, but he was kind of lost. And so this uh, book um, picks up where the book about my mom leaves off. But actually what I want to do first is read a poem that my dad wrote. Um, he wrote one poem in his whole life and it was for me for my 60th birthday. And he sent it to me. I, I could just see him writing this on a yellow legal pad. He was a lawyer, um, really concentrating on it. And that he sent it to me in an email and he said, um, don't judge me too harshly. He was very nervous about sending this to me. So I, it's the frontispiece of the book. And here goes. Science tells us that to live, one needs air and water, but to have a better life, one must have a daughter. To have one so talented, caring and bright, even makes old age all right. And that just touched me so deeply. So um, this uh, begins, as you, you will see, uh, this, so this poem, first poem in the book that I wrote, starts, uh, takes place on the night after my mother died. And uh, just the, the form of these poems is that the title does double duty. It's also the first line of the poem. And then the poem are all in uh, three line standards here, just to give you a visual of what that looks like. When my father wakes up on that first sweltering night of that first scalding summer, soaked in sweat, like my mother when she suffered those terrible hot flashes 40 years ago. He stumbles out of bed and lumbers to the archaic air conditioner, fumbling for the right button to bring it back to life with a wheeze and a groan and a thump. Next, he shuffles across the faded carpet, slides between the worn sheets and lifts the torn blanket to cover my mother, who will surely grow stiff from the frigid air blowing between them as she had for more than 60 years. Who could blame him for forgetting she had left him and was now slumbering on the other side of town, wrapped in a shroud beneath the stony, stubborn ground? How he missed her old, cold shoulder. And this poem is about the first grocery shopping trip my dad and I took together after my mom died. Yes, we have no bananas. My father croons off key as we stroll through the supermarket. Shall we get some? He asks, a standing joke between us. My father hates bananas, peaches, plums, mangoes, anything mushy makes him shudder in disgust. Remember that time I baked you banana bread? I stop our cart to ask. You loved it until I told you what it was, remember? Really, my father says, impossible. He backs away from the bananas as though they mean him harm. I don't remember. Sure you do, I insist. I put three pieces on a plate and you ate them all. It was the summer before I went off to college. My father steers clear of the bananas and pushes the cart towards the deli. Where'd you go to college again, he asks, placing a package of rugelach into the cart. Vermont, I say, removing the rugelach, which is bad for his diabetes. Don't you remember? We drove up and stopped for lunch at that diner in Montpelier, and the one woman working there was seating people, taking orders, cooking, running the register, and mom felt so sorry for her, she offered to leap over the counter and lend a hand. Remember? At this, my father brightens. Ah, your mother, he says, she could have done it. She could do anything almost anything, I correct him. There was one thing she could never do. I reach for a bag of whole wheat bagels. What's that, my father asked, genuinely curious. She could never get you to eat a banana. That's true. My father's chortle 
dies in his throat. I would eat every banana in the world just to see her one more time, he says. And we both fall silent, make fists around the handle of our grocery cart, and together we push on. So my father's decline was all mental. He was in perfect health physically. He played tennis until his late 80s, as you saw in the slides. Um, we would um, go somewhere and he would leap out of the car and dash across the parking lot and I'd have to run to keep up with him. So physically he was fine, but mentally he started having what the doctors called episodes. They weren't really strokes. They weren't really not strokes. They were episodes. So this is one such episode. Heaven can rely on you, sings a chorus of strapping young men in sweet, deep voices that blend inside my father's head. Don't you hear them, he asks, then shrugs, unconcerned about being the sole witness to this tender serenade. He holds up a finger, signaling, wait, wait. The men have stopped, but then they start up again. Gouda, 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 my father sings along. Like the cheese, I tease, trying to make light of this newest delusion. My father frowns, it isn't funny, and cocks his head like a puzzled puppy, trying to make sense of what's being said. The sound, any sound, a precious gift, since he doesn't hear much these days. Not the telephone's startled and startling shriek, not the blasting TV's blathering newscaster, not the neighborhood dog's insistent sharp bark, not the rain's hard hammer against the sliding glass door, and not a peep from the little boy who appears at the foot of his bed night after night, his eyes as blue as my father's before the cataracts floated in, two puffy clouds across his morning sky. Who is he, Dad? I ask. My father shrugs and lifts his finger again. Yes, dear, he says. I will, dear. He looks towards my mother's chair, and out of nowhere, I hear her too, her, vo her voice, the weak whisper of that terrible last day. Don't worry, sweetheart. She cupped my cheek with her worn, withered hand. There's no problem so terrible that it can't get worse. Gouda, 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 sings my father, happily off key, swaying in his seat, his ancient voice cracking like a young bar mitzvah boy's. Deedle, 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 zuzza, zuzza, zuzza. So the problem did get worse. Um, and this is a poem kind of about that. It's kind of interesting. Um, my mother appears in the poems about my father a little more frequently than the book about my mother, where my father did appear, but not as often. And I think it was because he was still alive. So I didn't feel the need to write about him as much as after both my parents were gone. They, um, my father just appeared more. I mean, my mother's appeared more in my mother's. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay. My father drove my mother crazy for 63 years, one foot on the brake, one foot on the gas, the car lurching along the Long Island Expressway. My father steering with his left hand on the wheel, his right arm slung across the back of the seat, his hand stroking my mother's rigid right shoulder as if it were a frightened feral cat. Knowing she was taking her life in her hands by putting her life in his hands, she sat fuming in the front seat, chain smoking her Chesterfield Kings and saying not a word as we zigzag through rush hour traffic, my father speeding up, slowing down, switching lanes, all the while singing, if ever I should leave you, fancying himself a dead ringer for a dashing Robert Goulet. Now she is gone and I am riding shotgun, buckled in like an anxious child at an amusement park who has somehow been convinced to get on the scariest ride of all. My left hand grips the edge of the dashboard, my right, thump pumps, my right foot pumps an invisible brake, and I dare not say a word to my fearless father, lest he turn away from the road to read my lips and take us both out once and for all. 
As we zoom through a few lights, green, yellow, red, I narrow my eyes into slits as if I am watching a horror movie until I hear a cacophony of beeps and honks coming from a long row of cars my father has zipped past before taking a left from the middle lane and cutting off a blue Buick right in front of a police officer standing on the sidewalk whose head snaps around as she jumps up and down waves her arms frantically and blows the whistle at my father who murmurs, oh shoot, as he pulls over and rolls down his window. The cop looks young enough to be my daughter and tough enough to tell my father what he needs to hear. It's high time for him, he, high time he stopped driving. She peers into the car and tilts her head at me. Really? You let this old guy behind the wheel? And asks for his driver's license. What the hell were you thinking, sir? You ran a red light and turned from the wrong lane. My father hangs his head like a naughty boy, apologizes profusely, promises to be more careful next time, then roars with laughter as we roar away, pleased to get off with only a warning. Back home, he swerves around the corner and clunks the car, kathunk, over the bump at the foot of the driveway he's been meaning to fix for 50 years, scrapes the bush beside the garage door and races out of the car towards the house, stopping only to grab the mail, which he rifles through, tucking a telltale yellow traffic ticket under his arm. Whew. I sit to collect myself before joining him in the kitchen for a cup of tea and a conversation I've waited too long to have, but have rehearsed in my head many times. Sometimes I pose it as a question. Dad, don't you think it's time to stop driving? Sometimes I state it as fact. Dad, it's time for you to stop driving. Sometimes I appeal to his conscience. Dad, what if you kill someone? What if you hurt a child? I steel myself to start the talk, but as I set down our tea, my father speaks first. You know, he says, I had a client whose kids made him stop driving. He didn't speak to any of them for the last three years of his life. He blows on his tea and takes a noisy slurp as I let that sink in. And you remember Minnie and Abe? Their oldest son took away the card keys when Minnie was 95 and Abe was 96. So what did they do? My father does not wait for an answer. They rented a car twice a week to get groceries. Where there's a will, there's a way. My father finishes his tea in one great gulp, pushes back his chair, stands and bangs his mug down on the table like a gavel. Case closed. So then this happened. It was not a stroke of genius. It was not a stroke of luck. It was a stroke of misfortune that befell my father, leaving him crumpled at the foot of the driveway next to the garbage, waiting all morning to be picked up. So that was the beginning of a new phase of my father's life. He had to obviously stop driving, stop playing tennis. Uh, he had to sell, give up his law practice, which was huge, sell his home, move into independent living. It was very rough. So um, what my father preferred doing um, instead of being in the present, he preferred living in the past because it was a happier time in his life. So this is a poem about that. Before he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great grandfather, he tells me he was a handsome young lad with barely two nickels to rub together, which was just enough to take the girl of his dreams out on a Saturday night. The subway rumbled into the station as she sat while he hung from a strap until they reached Whitehall Terminal and got off to get on the Staten Island Ferry. It was a moonless star-studded night. The sea sloshed against the stern. They stood side by side watching Manhattan's skyline disappear, her head anchored on his shoulder, his arm tied around her waist. He knew he had exactly 25 minutes to steal a kiss before they reached the shore. He asked Lady Liberty to wish him luck as he gathered his girl into the safe harbor of his arms and leaned towards her. The two of them drifted away until they reached the end of the line. 
That was 70 years ago. Now he is 90. Now she is gone. Now he has three children, four grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. Now he has diabetes, high blood pressure, a pacemaker. Now he doesn't know if it's Sunday or Monday, if he takes two yellow pills and one white pill each morning or the other way around, if he already read the newspaper this morning or not, and why it matters, the news is all bad anyway. He'd rather close his eyes, take a little rest, and remember the gentle weight of her head on his shoulder, the sweet curve of her waist under his hand, the softness of his lips of her lips against his, the stars shining, the sea sloshing. What a gift to drift away. Um, I wanted to read the title poem of this book as well. I wish my father a very happy birthday and yell in his ear, Dad, can you believe you're 90? He backs out of my hug, tilts his head to one side and peers at me intently, trying to figure out if what I'm saying is true. Then he collapses onto a kitchen chair as if the weight of every day of those 90 years is pressing down on him hard. Got any words of wisdom, Dad? I try to lighten the mood. <sighs> he sighs deeply, shakes his head vigorously, and then begins to speak. My mother died at 80, my brother at 50, my sister at 35. I don't know when my father died. Maybe he never did. He'd be 127 now, the old bastard, and it would serve him right. I haven't seen him since 1939 when he went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back. I was 12 and went right to work, shining shoes for a penny, selling newspapers for a nickel. Later, I went to CCNY and became a CPA. I was always a numbers man but never thought I'd make it to 90. In my day, no one lived to be 90. Who would want to? Certainly not me, but here I am. Blood pressure, 120 over 80, pulse 60, all 32 teeth still in my mouth. How did I get to be so unlucky? I was supposed to drop dead at my desk when I was 75, maybe 80, and leave your mother a million bucks. Who knew her days were numbered? Four score, four years more, and then poof, abracadabra, she was gone. That was some lousy trick, her disappearing act. How could she leave me to my lonesome to carry on without her for four years, eight months, three weeks, six days? He looks at his watch, 19 hours, 27 minutes and 32 seconds, but hey, he shrugs, who's counting? Okay, I'll just read two more poems. My father was never on time once in his entire life. We could always count on him being a good 20 minutes early. I remember many a Saturday night with my father dressed to the nines in his sleek black tux and glittering diamond studs, pacing the hallway from front door to kitchen to dining room before ordering me to dash upstairs and see what was taking my impossible mother so goddamn long. I find her sitting side saddle on a stool in a white silk slip surrounded by crumpled tissues imprinted with lip prints of lipstick the color of apples, clasping a sparkling bracelet around her wrist, clipping on a pair of matching earrings and muttering to herself in the bedroom mirror. I know the early bird catches the worm, but who the hell wants a goddamn worm? She'd hand me a pendant shaped like a tear to fasten around her neck, then raise a silver aerosol can, the hairspray hissing like a snake as she circled her head three times, forcing me to step back from the cloud that always made me cough. Once I came home from college for Thanksgiving and my father drove me to the airport for my return flight on a snowy Sunday afternoon. Somehow my stuffed to the gills suitcase never made it out to the car. After he finished yelling and screaming and carrying on, my father drove us home and drove us back to the airport and I was still an hour early for my flight. It made me laugh when my father proudly showed me a note he received after my mother died. Dear Mr. Newman, thank you for coming to buy bar mitzvah. You were the first one there. I wonder just how early he was and how on earth he would feel to learn from that from this day forth, for all time, he will always and forever be known as the late Mr. Newman.
And this is the last poem of the book. So the book begins with my, my parents being separated by my mother's death and the book ends with my parents being reunited with my father's death. My mother is at the bridge table with Loretta, Gert and Pearl when my father finds his way to heaven. Sit down, dear, she says, patting the seat beside her and barely looking up from the hand she's been dealt. The game is almost through, but my father is too overcome to sit he stands and stares at his beloved, free of wheelchair and oxygen tank, happily puffing away on a Chesterfield King held between two perfectly manicured fingers, sipping a cup of instant Maxwell House, leaving a bright red lip print on the white china cup. Her hair, the lovely chestnut brown it was the day they met. Her face, free of worry lines, the diamond pendant he bought her on their first trip to Europe, glittering against her ivory throat. She looks like the star of an old black and white movie who would never give him the time of day, but somehow spent 63 years by his side. I missed you, my father tells my mother, leaning down to kiss her offered cheek. Of course you did, says my mother, who always knows everything. She plays her cards right, and after Loretta and Pearl and Gert fold, she stands to let my father take her in his arms and in their heavenly bodies, they dance. Thank you, Leslie. Those are, those are all beautiful. Um, I see Yvonne has a comment. And um, Yvonne, you're welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like to. Hey, Yvonne. Hey, Leslie. So, I, a part I was thinking about, you know, the 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 obviously the two um, books that you're reading from, um, and part of the reason, I mean, I continue to write about my mom, and she's been gone for decades now, um, but there always seems to be something else to write about, some other memory that has come up for me, and I think part of the reason I write so much about her is. Um, to help people who never got the chance to meet her know her a little bit. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that um, it, it sort of helps keep her alive for me in, in some way. Um, and I just wondered how much of either of those things enter into your writing. Well, I have to say um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my parents to people who never had the chance to meet them. Um, and they're very taken with them, it seems, especially my dad. I think his personality maybe comes out a little more in these poems, but you know, people just seem very charmed by him and he was a very charming guy. And I do have to say that in turn, each time I finished writing you know, these books, the grief just welled up in a whole new way because it felt like I was losing them all over again. So um, writing the poems really, I kept them close to me and reading from the books keeps them close to me. So I'm very grateful for any opportunity I have to, to read from the books. It was just interesting to me. I mean, it's interesting that um, the motivations are, are somewhat similar. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by that, but um, anyway, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I, I'm sure I'll be writing about them for the rest of my life. Yeah. And one thing that happens that um, makes me sad is that as I write, I come up with questions that I don't have a chance to ask them anymore, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, that makes me, uh, Leslie, think about, you know, what I was going to ask you about the um, the poem about your mother and father when they were dating, and then the last poem about when she's at the bridge table. Obviously, you've let your imagination incorporate that a little bit to um, fill in the blanks, and I love that. You know, because like you said, the more we think about our parents or a loved one who's gone the more questions we have and what do you do with that and um, I think that is part of the joy of writing and um, writing creative creatively is just giving ourselves that freedom to fill in the blanks as we might based on what you already know um, and what you can assume and um, 
was any of that, especially the the part about your parents and when they were dating, did more of that come from stories from your father that he told you or was that all just how you imagined that it might have unfolded? Well, I know that, you know, my parents grew up without much money at all. And so my father had to be creative. So one thing that he did, and I think a lot of people, you know, in his social circle did was a big date was riding the Staten Island Ferry because it just cost a nickel. So, um, so I know that they did do that. Did he steal a kiss? Knowing my dad, I bet he did. <laughs> but, so, but, you know, that all the details, of course, come from my imagination. And um, then the last poem, um, you know, who knows what happens in heaven or the world to come or whatever you think, but my parents were great bridge players and everyone who my mom played bridge with died before she did, Loretta and Gert and Pearl. So I like to think that they were, have been reunited and are playing bridge up, up in heaven or, or in the world to come. Yeah, I really love that last poem. I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the covers of both of the books. They're so yes. beautiful and um, I'd love to hear more about them. So you can see them behind me. Um, so uh, the cover artist is, na her name is Carol Marine and she's a wonderful artist and she does an oil painting every day as her spiritual practice, which I find so inspiring. Um, and then she has them all on her website and my publisher, and I just wanna put in a pl plug also for my publisher, Headmistress Press. They are a wonderful, wonderful uh, small press. Uh, they specialize in uh, poems by lesbians. Um, so my, and my editor, Mary Miriam, just I think just has a very wonderful aesthetic. And so when she is the one who found uh, I had the idea of shoes for the cover because my mom loved shoes and my idea was a little um, cliche which was a, a you know a little kid clomping around in her mother's shoes and I sent a photo of that and Mary was like no 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 but let's look for shoes and so um, Carol Marine has a whole section in on her website of shoes and when I found this I cried and um, I knew that was the right cover and what I love about it is like one shoe is go, go facing forward into the future and one shoe is facing back into the past. And I, I just loved that. Um, and my mother, like I said, sold shoes. She had beautiful feet, size six and a half, petite, high arched. Um, I used to joke with her, I could wear your shoes as earrings because my feet are much bigger than that. So then um, I knew I wanted the, the books to be similar in appearance. So I went back to Carol Marine's website and she had a section uh, she has like still lives, flower shoes, and she also has a section called New York. And my parents were both lifelong New Yorkers. And I said, I'm going to find the, the photo, uh, the painting for my dad's book in the New York section. And this photo just captures my dad as if she knew him intimately, which of course this painting was done before the book. But my dad had white hair, he had blue eyes, so he was always wearing a light blue tie. He had this kind of camel hair business coat. So I, I just love this painting and I just love both of them. And I think the books just, I, I just love, my, I joke that my parents were a box set. <laughs> um, and that they, the two books go hand in hand the way my parents went hand in hand for 63 years. So yeah, I, I encourage everybody to check out Carol Marine's website, which Christy uh, kindly put in the chat and also Headmistress website because they have a lot of wonderful books. I like that, your parents being a box set. That's great. <laughs> Um, so let's see the, the last thing that, um, you know, maybe we can talk about real quickly is your children's book books that you've written. You've written so many wonderful things and, um, I would love to, I know you mentioned you wanted to read from it and talk a little bit about how poetry works with children's literature. So I know there are some poets here because I recognize you and I really encourage you to think about writing children's books because the text of a picture book can be a poem. There's so much in common. Um, they're succinct, right? You have very few words to, to convey something. Um, they use a lot of the same literary techniques such as repetition, sometimes rhyme. The page turn in a picture book works like a stanza break. So I'm going to read um, with your indulgence. I'm gonna share my screen again and read a short um, picture book which the text of which is a um, poem. So I'm gonna share my screen again so you could also see the illustrations. Okay, so here we go. Inside there was light, outside there was darkness. Inside it was warm, 
Outside, it was windy. Inside, there was laughter. Inside, the boy waited for the Seder to start. Outside, the kitten waited for the moon to rise. So that is poetry, right? I'm going to stop sharing and come back to you. So if you're a poet, or even if you're not a poet, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Try your hand at a children's book. See what happens. You never know your own gene, the depths of your own genius until you try something new. Perfect advice and um, perfect to end on that note. Thank you so much, Leslie, for sharing that story. I want to leave a link one more time in the chat box because Leslie is um, selling her books directly on her website and a dollar from each book bought directly will go to the Bright Spot Therapy Dogs. So it's a great opportunity to not only purchase a couple of wonderful, beautiful books, but also to um, know that your money is going to a great cause. So I'll drop that one more time into the chat box. And, and I'll just say that I, I chose that charity because, or that organization, because my dad loved dogs and was very comforted when the therapy dog stopped by his hospital bed. So there's a direct link. Very nice, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Leslie, for giving of your time today and sharing your stories and your poetry. Really, I loved it. I'm, I'm, I'm um, really in awe of the covers as well. So thanks for sharing a little bit about Headmistress Press. I hope people will have a chance to go over there and take a peek at their website as well. Um, and everyone, I hope you'll stop by hiddentimberbooks.com. We've got more readings coming up down the line. Once this recording is all edited and up on the YouTube site, you can go back and review it again and um, look at any of the other ones as well. So, Leslie, wonderful to have you here. I hope to see you out in the world again soon and hear more about your work. Thanks, Christy. It was really a pleasure. It was a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>